For those of you who didn't have a chance to attend the International Fetal Medicine and Surgical Society meeting, Stay Current has you covered. Dr. Beth Rymeski, fetal surgeon at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and myself, Ray Hankey, created a tasting menu of the topics covered through a series of focused interviews. Before we begin, here's a few words from Dr. Uli Merlin and the conference organizing committee. The International Fetal Medicine and Surgical Society promotes development and advances in fetal diagnosis and therapy and supports education and research in this field. A very warm welcome from Switzerland and I hope you all will enjoy listening to this podcast. Now for the meat of it. We split our coverage into three sections. Starting it off today, we have clinical translation and clinical trials. We begin our journey in Melbourne, Australia with Ben Omberg, an MD PhD student at Monash University. And so I guess the, the context of it is that when they do video guided fetoscopic surgery and inserting the video camera into the uterus, essentially the amniotic fluids really cloudy and there's limited space and, and visibility to do surgery endoscopically. So to sort of increase the visibility and overcome those problems, they drain the amniotic fluid and they inflate the uterus with carbon dioxide. This sort of process is still quite experimental and still learning a lot. And one of the things that has sort of been thought is that because the gas that we use, CO2 is quite soluble, that some of that CO2 might dissolve into baby's blood and that might cause, it might accumulate and cause problems with the acid base status. So essentially we sort of took this to, into the lab and we've got a really great sheet facility in Australia and at Monash. And so we sort of replicated that draining the fluid and inflating the uterus with the gas. And, and we could monitor the fetal blood status and see how levels of carbon dioxide change in the baby's blood. We sort of had two arms. We sort of had the, the standard carbon dioxide and we found that CO2 levels rose quite quickly and to quite high levels. And then we found that when we use heated humidified CO2. So we ran it through a humidifier, which is really just like a glorified kettle. It just bubbles <laughs> the gas through some warm water. The levels of CO2 are much, much less in the in the lambs. And so like this was a really interesting finding and it probably the, the answer to it we've sort of found is it comes down to some quite simple chemistry to do with carbon dioxide. As you heat the gas up, you actually lower its solubility by about half. And so by lowering the solubility, you sort of slow the rate at which the fetus absorbs the carbon dioxide and therefore, yeah, you can sort of stabilize how well they tolerate surgery. So it's amazing to come to a meeting like this and present to your EndNote library and see them all sitting in the crowd and, and to see people sort of take it up and move it into clinical practice is huge. So Wonderful. Great, great work. Yeah, thank you. About 17,000 kilometers away across the Pacific Ocean in the entirety of the U.S., Barbara Coons, a recent research fellow at CHOP and current resident at Columbia Presbyterian, also explored the effect of fetoscopic surgery. Uh, at CHOP, we've been developing a technology called EXTEND, or the Extrauterine Environment for Neonatal Development. It was initially developed as a treatment for extreme prematurity, but it also happens to have very easy access to the fetus for study. So it also happens to be a prime location for some studies looking at carbon dioxide insufflation on the fetus. So what'd you find? So we did a series of three different experiments. Number one, we compared just completely untreated carbon dioxide uh, with warm humidified carbon dioxide. We maintained the fetus in what's called PASI or partial amniotic carbon insufflation. So the, uh, the fetus is half covered by amniotic fluid. We chose this because this is how it's done clinically and we wanted to make it look like a fetoscopic repair. Exactly. So we found that warm humidified air was in fact safer for the fetus, that there were lower rates of PCO2 mm -hmm. uh, development and lower rates of pH decreasing. Okay. So the pH remained more stable throughout the insufflation and there was no effect on the blood flow through the umbilical cord just from that insufflation. Mm -hmm. So, okay, well, what if we unsubmerged the cord mm -hmm. but kept the same amount of skin exposed? So we, we moved the cord into the air, so out of the amniotic mm -hmm. fluid, and though we did not see any change in the pH or the PCO2, we did see a decrease in the blood flow through the umbilical cord, mm -hmm. and that decreased as a result the oxygen delivery to the fetus. Okay, well, now that we've taken the cord out of the fluid, what happens if we expose more skin? Mm -hmm. So what if it's instead of partial, we do total amniotic carbon dioxide insufflation? With that, we did not see any significant pH or PCO2 changes, but we did see the blood flow changes reproduced. Mm -hmm. So take home for this for people doing fetoscopic repairs, mm -hmm. 
would be make sure you use warm humidified, mm -hmm. keep the umbilical cord submerged, mm -hmm. and keep doing that partial amniotic carbon insulation. A few translational take-home messages from these two groups. For fetoscopic surgery, use warm humidified air, don't increase the amniotic fluid drainage, and be sure the umbilical cord is submerged throughout the case to minimize the impact of CO2 on the fetus. Next, we reflected on genes and ethics with Dr. David Steidelman, pediatric surgeon, and Adele Riccardi, MD-PhD student at Yale University. So clinically, the way that, that pediatric surgeons interact with genetic disease are the following. So sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. we place phoresis catheters. We're called to the emergency room for pain crises. We place feeding tubes after strokes. Genetic mutation is known. And so if you cured that mutation, you would prevent the need for those things. In cystic fibrosis, we're asked to place patients on ECMO as a bridge to lung transplant. We're asked to explore baby's abdomens for meconium perforation. The mutation is known. And so if you could correct that mutation, you could cure these diseases and prevent that morbidity. Mm -hmm. So in broad strokes, our research is trying to cure these genetic diseases before birth. There are a handful of advantages to curing diseases before birth. Yeah, so many of the diseases that we're interested in manifest in pathology very early on in life, often at the time of birth or early in the neonatal period. So we were interested in coming up with a safe and effective way for potentially correcting mutations during the initial stages of disease pathogenesis, so in the in utero period during fetal development. And we took kind of a, a biomedical engineering approach, and we have a highly collaborative project. So our project involved Dr. Sittleman, who's a pediatric surgeon, as well as a team of biomedical engineers and geneticists at Yale University to come up with the strategy that we, we came up with for gene editing in utero. What'd you do and what'd you find? <laughs> Yeah, so we worked on a nanoparticle-based approach to deliver these gene editing molecules that a scientist named Peter Blazer at Yale University has been developing for the last 30 years. These molecules can introduce a specific change back to what the gene should be. And what we worked on was delivering these nanoparticles in utero, and we first worked on a mouse model of beta thalassemia, which mm -hmm. is one of the most common genetic diseases, and we showed that we could correct that mutation before birth and that mice were born with normal hemoglobin concentrations and that they also had an increased lifespan when we were able to treat the disease in utero. Uh, and we've also recently been working on cystic fibrosis, which is a devastating disease that has pathology in many, many organs at birth. And we recently showed that we can correct the most common mutation in cystic fibrosis using nanoparticles in utero, and that results in sustained protein function after birth. That's incredible. It sounds like yeah. science fiction. So my understanding so. of it is that we're doing um, molecular Microsoft Word. So when you go find okay. and replace, we can molecularly say find the gene that's problematic and replace to correct it in the way that you want. You know, when you control find, is it going to take out every single yeah, element you so. find? No, the software's not that good yet. Okay. So what do you think the realistic timeline of when are we going to actually start using this in babies? Um, you think this I is... worry about having that approach to it. I think that if your goal is to have it in clinic by 10 years, you, you run the risk of doing dangerous things. And so I think you continue to test until you have the level of safety and efficacy where you're comfortable moving forward with, with clinical translation. To this point, we see no off-target effects. We've injected these agents and followed our animals out for two years and see no tumor formation or, you know, we see health, you know, healthy and normal development. And so these animals can go on to have their own babies as well that are healthy for generations. And did their babies have the mutation? We're not currently correcting the germline. You know, if you could remove cystic fibrosis from someone's germline, they don't have cystic fibrosis and then their kids and grandkids don't have it. There are ethical issues surrounding this, but if you ask families who have watched their children die of cystic fibrosis, those families are in favor of wiping that gene out of their family. These are truly exciting possibilities for curing life-altering diseases. Now we shift gears to talk about two different clinical studies underway. First, Dr. Anna David tells us about her work with osteogenesis imperfecta. I'm developing treatments for uh, severe life-threatening diseases which currently have no treatment. And what I'm talking about at IFMSS is the first clinical trial of in utero stem cell transplantation 
for brittle bone disease. And when you say brittle bone disease, you're talking about osteogenesis imperfecta? Or it's agnosis? osteogenesis imperfecta. It's the mm-hmm. first clinical trial in the world. And what we're doing is we're diagnosing severe brittle bone disease using molecular diagnosis, mm-hmm. um, using amniocentesis. On scan, you can make the diagnosis. You can see they have very short fractured bones. Um, and we're giving a transfusion of fetal liver um, mesenchymal stem cells, ultrasound guided into the umbilical vein, which honed the bone. And there have been about three or four cases in the world that have uh, been treated and appear to have a phenotypic correction. So we're doing two parts of the trial. The first part is initially to test out the stem cells um, to see if they're safe. Um, so we're giving that initially to neonates that have the disease. So we're giving four transplants um, every four months from birth. And then once we've treated five patients and we know it's safe, we're then going to go and treat this in utero. Wonderful. That's amazing. So you are currently enrolling patients in the trial? So the trial has opened in Sweden and the UK. Yeah. Um, we hope we're going to open in the Netherlands and also in Germany as well. And finally, we sit down with Dr. Eric Jellen to talk about the RAFT trial. So I'm Eric Jellen. I'm the fetal program director at Johns Hopkins Children's Center. I'm also the lead PI of the RAFT trial, which stands for the Renal and Hydramnios Fetal Therapy Trial. And this is a trial that is designed to answer the question of whether or not serial amnio infusions can effectively and safely lead to respiratory survival in fetuses that previously we know would all have died from anhydramnios at an early age. These are the the babies that typically have been labeled Potter sequence, and they have had a universal 100% mortality from respiratory uh, insufficiency until now. In the mid-2010s, there was a case report of a fetus that was able to survive after serial amnio infusions with normal saline out of our center. And this was actually concordant with an experiment of nature where there was a a set of monozygotic monoamniotic twins. So one of the twins had bilateral renal agenesis, wasn't making any urine, would have been anhydramniotic, except for the fact that it had a twin Mm -hmm. that was making urine for it. And when it delivered uh, close-ish to term, it had normal respiratory function. That was sort of an experiment of nature that inspired that initial therapy in that patient. With that in mind, we set out to create a uh, prospective uh, non-randomized trial, multi-center, to actually study the risks, benefits of this therapy, maternal safety, feasibility, and efficacy, which sort of had all been skipped because of this one successful case report. And the trial is ongoing and we've we've enrolled a number of patients and actually had some, some pretty decent success. And what I think it's important to know from the pediatric surgery perspective is that we will now probably be confronted with more babies that are small. I mean, all of them are essentially premature. The question is how late we can get them with mm-hmm. this therapy. And they all are going to have uh, no renal function. So we're going to be in the position where we are asked to put in peritoneal dialysis catheters or even hemodialysis catheters in the future in babies we may have not uh, been comfortable doing that before. Mm -hmm. And we've had good success with uh, single cuffed, small swan neck catheters. And we've been able to do dialysis on these patients successfully, grow them up, and uh, a few have gone on to successful kidney transplant. Now, I can't give you numbers for how likely that is to be. We're, We're trying to figure that out so that we can appropriately counsel our patients and really understand whether or not this is a reasonable therapy to offer patients or not, and in what context. Does the trial have a neonatal treatment protocol associated with it to help guide people as to how to manage the feeds and and all of that, or is that left to the discretion of the treating institution? So the design of the trial is such that it's to really assess whether or not there can be reliable pulmonary survival in these fetuses. And we don't mandate the treatment of the newborn. That's almost like the outcome, whether or not the fetus is salvageable by the standard of care Mm -hmm. for neonates with end-stage renal disease. And the outlook is should be good if we can get pulmonary survival based on the largest data sets that we have, because there are neonates that currently undergo dialysis for end-stage renal disease. And if you look at the registry studies, which admittedly are flawed, but do have some value, 
overall survival to transplant in that group is around 70 to 80 percent. So there's reason for optimism in that group with our just regular standard of care that we're applying. Hopefully, we may learn from this trial about neonatal dialysis, particularly in the premature infant group, that provides us with the knowledge to create guidelines. I just don't think that we have enough data about how these kids should be treated postnatally to create guidelines. One of the problems that we've seen in putting PD catheters in these little babies is the momentum tends to get caught up in the catheter and the catheter stops working. Yeah. So we have started doing prophylactic omentectomies in a lot of the smaller infants. Is that something that you guys are doing or that you're, you think other people might be doing? I think if it, it, it's a very good idea. It depends on the technique that you use to place the dialysis catheter. If you're doing it open, you know, which you will be if the baby is very small, I think doing an omentectomy is an easy addition to the surgery and can definitely help avoid that problem. But if you're doing it laparoscopically, I think it actually is an unnecessary step. And we have had equal success with and without doing omentectomies. So my anecdotal experience is that it's not necessary, but I think that once we get more data, we'll, we'll be able to answer that question more definitively. That's your IFMS coverage for the day. Stay tuned for next time when we discuss technical and educational innovation. Have any questions or thoughts about the topics discussed today? Please share them on the Stay Current app, Twitter, or Facebook. This chapter is created and edited by Todd Ponsky, Alex Kassar, Alex Gibbons, and myself, Ray Hankey. Remember, knowledge should be free. <laughs>